Hey everyone, it's Colin. How's it going? The 1980s brought some dramatic changes to the way we listen to music. The compact disc offered unrivaled convenience and sound quality, and the Walkman put a cassette player in your pocket. And in 1988, Sony put the two together in a show of its miniaturization skills and ended up producing the world's smallest portable CD player. This is the D88, sometimes referred to as the Pocket Discman, and was quite the feat of engineering when it launched. As was typical for Sony's portable products at the time, its exterior is mostly made of metal and has a heavy, solid build quality. It wasn't Sony's first portable CD player. That honor belongs to the D5-D50 from 1984, but it had one standout feature, its size. The D88 was physically smaller than a standard CD, and that's because it was intended to play the relatively new 8cm compact disc format, often referred to as the mini CD. These held a maximum of 24 minutes of audio and were part of a music industry push to replace 45 RPM vinyl records. As those were typically used for singles, so too would be the mini CD, sometimes also called CD3 after its 3-inch diameter. But the D88 also had a trick up its sleeve. Its center spindle sat on a clever mechanism that allowed it to slide further away from the laser assembly. One could move it to its outer position using a latch on the bottom, then open the lid and swing a plastic guard out of the way and suddenly the player could now accept standard size CDs. Of course, since they'd stick out the side, it limited just how portable the D88 could be in practice, but it at least gave the model some additional value and notoriety. I bought mine from a seller in Japan, and while it arrived in cosmetically excellent condition, it had what I would soon learn to be a common problem. It would spin up the disc, but failed to read it. This condition can affect other Sony portables from the 80s, and fellow YouTuber and friend of the channel SJM4306 has a few episodes where he tackles it. So I set out to do the same. A few screws hold the bottom cover on the unit. Some of them are different lengths, so I drew a quick sketch on a sticky note and taped the screws to it to keep them in order. I removed the lever from the sliding mechanism, then lifted the bottom cover free. Sony was known for its skills at miniaturizing components, and the D88 exemplifies this. Its PCB is packed with parts and a number of wires and flat flex cables. No doubt it was tricky to manufacture. I took out a pair of screws that held the PCB to the chassis. Then I disconnected this smaller flex cable that goes to the laser assembly and removed some of the tape securing the wires in order to free up some slack. At that point, I carefully lifted up the board and moved it to the side. I didn't need to remove it completely, just get it sufficiently out of the way from the area I needed to access. And this is the culprit, the middle gear in the laser sled assembly. It helps provide a reduction so the electric motor can precisely move the laser across the disc's surface. The problem is that the lubrication used on it has turned sticky over time. You can see how the C-clip I popped free is still clinging to the end of the post. It also not only prevents the gear from turning, but renders it much weaker. When I went to slide it off, it simply crumbled. I had to resort to using tweezers to pry it out, being careful not to damage the other gears. This middle gear is ruined. You can see how the old grease has stained the plastic green. It's also absolutely tiny, much too small for me to design and 3D print a replacement. So finding a new gear became my next task. Some searching revealed that it was used in a few other Sony players from the same era. 
I found listings for reproduction parts on Chinese e-commerce sites, some of which looked rather suspicious. But eventually, I ran across them on Taobao for a reasonable price. 40 yuan is roughly $6 US. I ordered two through a proxy service for a total of about 15 bucks, plus another 10 or so for international shipping and service fees. At the same time, I had found a seller in the US with a small quantity of new old stock original gears, and bought one just in case the others didn't work out. But this one set me back 60 bucks. And comparing them, the gears I bought from Taobao actually looked to be quite well made. Their dimensions were a match for the original, and the plastic molding appeared to be high quality. I suspect they would have worked fine, but since I paid so much for it, I decided to use the new old stock gear instead. The post was covered in the remains of the grease, and I cleaned it off with a cotton swab soaked in isopropyl alcohol. I needed to apply new lubricant, so I went with some white lithium grease, which I've had good luck with in the past on things like floppy drive mechanisms. Just a small dab is all that was necessary. Fitting the new gear in there without damaging it was tricky, not just because of how small it is, but also the tight confines. But I was ultimately able to get it in place and, with some luck, managed to snap the tiny retaining clip back on. Working on this player is both frustrating and fascinating. It's complex and tricky, but also a very tangible example of just how rapidly technology was advancing during its time. So, did the new gear fix it? Thankfully, yes. It spun up a disc and played it without any issue. I did notice something wrong with the LCD, and sadly, it's another common problem with this model. Some of the number segments aren't showing up. What looks like an L here is actually just the left half of the number zero, and as I skipped through tracks, you can see how the right digit isn't completely showing either. This is due to a problem with the display itself, but as I don't have any experience fixing it, and given that this player is relatively rare, I'll save it for another time. The D88 often gets called the world's smallest portable CD player, though depending on how you define portable, this may not be true. That's because there's no way to install a battery inside the unit. There just wasn't enough space for one. There is a DC input jack on the side, but having to carry a power adapter definitely cuts into the portability of the player. To use it on the go, one needed to attach the external battery caddy, which increased the player's size and weight. It used a rechargeable lead acid pack good for about two hours of playtime. And that battery was the only option for this player. The caddy couldn't hold alternatives like double A's. So taking this into account then, what is the smallest portable CD player that can actually be used portably? This one perhaps, unsurprisingly, also made by Sony. It's the D82, released around the same time as the D88. It's almost exactly the same size as that player without its battery caddy, and while it uses the same rechargeable pack, Sony's engineers managed to find space for it internally. This did mean losing that trick feature of being able to play full-size CDs. The D82 could only accept the smaller 8cm discs, but it does make it the smallest self-contained CD player. I had trouble testing out my D82 at first. The battery that came with my D88 had long since failed, and a new old stock one picked up from eBay wasn't any better. Considering they're over 30 years old, I'm not exactly surprised. What I was surprised to find was this cover over the DC input jack on the side. Removing it revealed a simple hole going into the side of the battery compartment. This player was so cramped for space, one needed to use a special dummy battery to power it externally. And these have become practically impossible to find. Thankfully, SJM4306 had come up with a solution for this, too. Other Discman players used the same lead-acid batteries, and he had designed a replacement consisting of a 3D-printed housing with custom PCB and powered by a modern lithium polymer cell. 
He very kindly sent one my way, and it did the trick to get my D82 working. Well, kind of. It spun up a disk, but was also having problems reading it. And that's because the D82 uses a very similar laser mechanism to that of the D88, so it suffers from the same issue with the sticky grease and failed middle gear. Since I had extra gears at this point, I figured repairing it would be straightforward. Except it wasn't. I took out the screws holding the PCB in, but couldn't figure out a way to move it to the side so I could access the laser assembly. This player is even more cramped inside, and the wiring looked especially delicate. It would be very difficult to take apart as far as I needed to, and given that it took me about a year to find this player to begin with, I decided not to press my luck. Better to leave it broken for now with the possibility of repair later than make a mistake while trying to fix it that would leave it damaged forever. Both the D88 and D82 offered simple functionality. Track skip, of course, with repeat and shuffle modes. Perhaps as a nod to using them on the go, they both included jacks for a wired remote control. But as this was before inline remotes were a thing, you'd still have to plug your headphones directly into the player. Sony did offer a few models of wireless remote, but given that these players were geared towards mini CDs, it seems like a bit of a stretch to have expected many people to use them with their home stereo system. And perhaps it comes as no surprise that neither of these models was exactly successful in the marketplace. The D88 sold for about $350 US when it launched, and while the D82 was seemingly only sold in Japan, it also went for the equivalent of about $200 even as late as 1990. And price aside, what really put some buyers off was the mini CD itself. In many parts of the world, including the United States, it just never took off. CD singles did see some popularity, but most frequently came on standard sized discs. Japanese consumers tended to have a bit more discretionary income during this time, so mini CDs were more popular there. But they were still relatively expensive and didn't get much cheaper over time. This one from 1998 cost the equivalent of $10 US and only had three songs, one of which was just an instrumental version of another track. So one would think that the D82 and 88 were the first and last of Sony's mini player lineup. But there was just enough momentum for the format in Japan that the company produced one final player in 1995, and it managed to rectify the biggest shortcomings of its predecessors. The D80 was in many ways a very different Discman from those. It was an all-plastic device, similar to other common players from the mid-90s, and like the D82, it sold for a bit over 20,000 yen. It also offered a major step up in terms of features. On the bottom were switches for headphone volume limiting and two levels of bass boost. If the player was connected to a power adapter, the charge button would start recharging the optional NICAD battery pack if it was installed. And if it wasn't, regular double A's could be used instead. But the biggest improvement was advertised right on its translucent lid. ESP, or Electronic Shock Protection. This used a memory buffer to mitigate skipping if the player was bumped or shaken, allowing the user to actually carry the player around while listening to music. The D82 and 88 were generally meant to be used only while stationary. This particular D80 shows some signs of wear, scratches in its finish along with evidence of batteries having leaked in it previously. And unfortunately, it too suffers from a faded LCD and playback problems. The laser keeps struggling to read the disc, though at least it's trying. I wondered if it possibly also had the same gear problem, so I took it apart to find out. This unit was thankfully far easier to work on, a product of even tighter component integration. Just a single PCB with the laser assembly sitting on top, which I disconnected and flipped over. I removed the cover from the bottom and found a similar three-gear reduction setup, but this time that middle gear was different. 
Instead of being stuck to a metal post, the gear had pegs molded into it, which rode in a pair of plastic channels. It moved smoothly enough on its own this way that Sony didn't add any grease, so the whole stuck and brittle gear situation was avoided. I added some fresh lithium grease to the laser carriage screw for good measure, then just to get the obvious out of the way, I carefully cleaned the laser lens with some isopropyl alcohol. That's really all the more I was able to do with confidence. It's possible that the laser itself needed adjustment, but I wasn't able to track down the service manual to know exactly how to do so. I did explore the possibility of failed capacitors causing the problem, but there were absolutely no signs of leakage from these. And like with the D82, this thing took me well over a year to find, so I decided not to try my luck. So did my meager repair attempt fix it? Of course not, but I don't think that comes as a surprise. Hopefully I'll be able to find the information I need and alongside the D82, be able to get it up and running again another time. And speaking of another time, these mini CD players really do feel like products from a different era. Compact discs in general have been the most successful physical audio media in history, one that's still clinging on to this day. But CD singles, and especially mini audio CDs, were just a blip in the format's history. And even though it may not serve a practical purpose, I think it's fun to explore these rarities, even if only through online auction photos. Which is how, for example, I learned about the rarest mini CD player of them all, the Crown CD10. Seem familiar? Yep, that's because it's basically just a rebadged Sony D88. And these days, they're worth way more than what they originally sold for. The last one I saw went for about as much as all three of my players combined. Collecting retro technology can certainly be expensive, frustrating, or both, but it's a tangible way of connecting with the past. And sometimes it can illustrate not just how history can repeat itself, but also give a glimpse into a future that could have been. If you liked the video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on social media at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.